Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm delighted to return to Oris and Sweat Marden today and a wonderful chapter from his book, The Joys of Living. Orison Sweat Martin was a wonderful New Thought teacher, and you can check out my previous episodes, including How to Get What You Want, For Those Who Are Discouraged, Expect Great Things, On the Law of Prosperity, and the beautiful discussion from this very book, which is called Living Today in the Here and Now. And the amazing thing is he was this incredible businessman, was very successful, owned hotels. But when you hear, for instance, that last episode where he's talking about the wonders of living in the moment and how we are always chasing rainbows in our life, you can see the absolute spiritual awakening that he went through, even though he had reached levels of prosperity. This is very common in the law of attraction. You become powerful, you learn to create your reality, and then you realize that it's about a lot more than just the money. The reason for that is the tragedy of postponed enjoyment. And it's one of the great tragedies today. I meet so many people that have huge goals and they don't celebrate what's happening right now. One of the great things that helped me on my current journey was when I started celebrating everything. I got two subscribers today. I was like, whoa, I'm so excited, let's celebrate. At the beginning when I started my YouTube channel, I would celebrate even the tiniest things and I still do. If I see a single like on a video, I get excited. And I started doing this, it started becoming a habit for me to enjoy because for a long time I'd had this huge goal that I wanted so bad and I had great things happening around me, wonderful moments all the time, but I was still living in that moment. Oh, it's not, I can't enjoy that yet. I'm looking at a beautiful painting or listening to a wonderful song, but I can't enjoy that yet because I have this thing and that's when I can give myself permission to be happy. You do not have to have permission to be happy. This right now can be your most joyful moment. And that is the tragedy of postponed enjoyment. If you're going to create your reality, it's about creating moments of joy now, not postponing your enjoyment until some future date, because you will always be chasing the rainbow. You will never catch it. The tragedy of postponed enjoyment by Orison Sweat Martin. The mill will never grind with the water that has passed. There was once a very brilliant and charming young man who made up his mind that he was going to devote the first half of his life to the amassing of a million and the balance in the unstined enjoyment of his money. He resolved to sacrifice every conflicting desire in pursuit of his one unwavering aim to cut off everything which could possibly conflict with his life purpose. He hushed the great longing in his heart for music and sacrificed his soul's calling for the beautiful, for art, until he could get the means for answering all these calls in his nature, which bade for his attention. Later, he felt sure he would revel in art and music But when this young man had made his first million, he found that his ambition called for another million, and he resolved to work a little longer and to quit when he had two millions. When he reached this point, however, his ambition had grown to monstrous proportions and kept calling for more, more. He resolved to break away and to enjoy what he had but he soon found that he was slaving under ambition's lash and he kept going on and on, making greater sacrifices of his finer nature until one day he caught a glimpse of himself in a long mirror. He was shocked at the gray hairs and wrinkles at the bent form. 
For a moment, he could not believe his eyes. But the truth very soon became painfully evident, and he resolved then and there to quit the money game and to start on his quest of pleasure. But he very soon found that he had lost his taste for many of the things which called so loudly in his youthful blood. When he began to travel, he was surprised to find that the great masterpieces of architecture, painting, and sculpture, which he had dreamed would give him such pleasure, were closed books to his mind, because his aesthetic faculties had become so atrophied that they no longer responded to stimulus. He then resolved that he would make a business of surrounding himself with friends for the balance of his life. But his friendship faculties had also gone out of business for the lack of exercise. He had sacrificed his friendships in pursuit of the dollar. He felt sure that his music, his first love, had not gone back on him, and he went on to the great centers of music to revel in the opera. But he soon found that his musical faculties had gone out of business, also atrophied from the lack of exercise. And so in his desperation, he turned from one thing to another, trying to enjoy himself. But he found that even dissipation no longer could give him satisfaction. He had lost all power of enjoyment, so that his fortune was but a mockery to him. He had sacrificed youth, health, his friends, his taste for music, for art, for literature, and he stood like a great skyscraper which had been ravaged by fire, a burned-out old man with a fortune but with no power to enjoy it. He had money, but nothing else. There is little except the form left to indicate that such men are human. Most of the qualities which make for real manhood, the sweeter, nobler, grander, sublimer qualities, which make normal men and women godlike, have been burned out of the life by the dollar mania. The time will come when these human monsters with vast fortunes will be looked upon as enemies of all that is highest and noblest and sweetest and cleanest in human life. Men and women will not always bow down to the golden calf. The only way to be happy is to take advantage of the little opportunities that come to us to brighten life as we go along, to postpone enjoyment day after day and year after year until we get more money or a better position is to cheat ourselves not only of present enjoyment but also of the power to enjoy in the future. One of the greatest tragedies of life is the postponement of enjoyment. I think the one great regret of most people when nearing the end of life is that they did not live as they went along, that they attempted to postpone their enjoyment instead of living to the full each day as it came. How often we see young people start out in life with small capital and work like slaves for years putting aside every opportunity for pleasure or relaxation, denying themselves the luxury of an occasional outing, the attendance at a theater or concert, a trip to the country, or the purchase of a coveted book, even postponing their reading and general culture until they have more leisure, more money. They delude themselves with the thought that when the following year arrives, they will take life easier, perhaps indulge in some of these things, but when next year comes, they think they must economize a little longer. Thus they put off every enjoyment from year to year. They think that next year they will be able to send their boy or girl to college, but the habit of saving, the craving for a little more money gets the better of them, and again they postpone. At length a time comes when they decide they can afford to indulge in a little pleasure. They go abroad or try to enjoy music or works of art or attempt to broaden their minds by reading and studying. But it is too late. 
They have become helplessly wedged into the rut the years have made about them. The freshness of life has departed. Enthusiasm has fled. The fires of ambition have died down. The long years of waiting have crushed the capacity to enjoy. The possessions for which they sacrificed all their natural and healthy longings for joy and brightness have turned to Dead Sea fruit. Such lives are repeated in thousands of homes about us. On every hand we see these burned out lives. This country is full of wrecks, of people who have forfeited their reputations, their health, their homes, their vacations, their opportunities for travel, for reading, and culture. Their friends, in fact, traded everything that was worthwhile for money. Has it paid? Thousands of men are nervous wrecks, practically friendless and homeless, as far as the things we prize most in a home are concerned, and all because of a desire to scrape together a few more dollars. Does it pay? Many a man has lost his life while trying to save a hat, or an umbrella, or a package in front of a trolley car, automobile, or carriage. What a foolish thing this is, we say, but there are tens of thousands of men in this country who have lost about everything in their lives that was worthwhile trying to get a few more dollars away from somebody else. The sacrifices we Americans make, the price we pay for our fortunes, is something appalling. Just take a look at the physical and mental wrecks we see on every hand. Does it pay to sacrifice the very thing for which we live? To get together a little more money? How often we see hungry, cadaverous men with great big pocketbooks. They have the money, but that is about all they have. Did you ever think, Mr. Selfish Greedy Man, of what you are losing on your way to your wealth? Did you ever realize that while you are gloating over the fact that you are getting ahead much faster than those about you, that you are losing something which is infinitely more precious? Nature keeps a one-priced store. She lets you take whatever you want, but you pay the price for it, and you often leave that which is infinitely more valuable than what you take. How many take the money but leave their character in exchange? How many swap their ability, their education for dollars? How many exchange all that is finest, most delicate, and sweetest in their natures for that which can only give a coarse satisfaction, can only feed the animal appetite? While you are grasping for more greedy dollars, your manliness may be oozing out, your nature may be hardening, your sympathy for your kind may be drying up, your affections may be becoming marbleized. You may find that you like coarser things than formerly, that refined, cultured, educated, good people do not interest you as they once did. You are sliding down. Greed has lowered your standard. I know businessmen who think they have made a great success in life because they have gained a fortune who would not recognize a photograph of themselves taken when they started out in the dollar chasing game for they have exchanged for dollars the most valuable things which they possessed at the start business diplomacy cunning have taken place of their former simple open straightforwardness their motto business is business has completely changed their life business policy has taken the place of principle of conviction the man who cultivates the habit of enjoyment who avails himself of the opportunity to indulge in some innocent pleasure to brighten and broaden his life by listening to good music or looking at rare works of art, studying the beauties of nature or reading an inspiring book, will unconsciously find himself far ahead in the race for success. He will be much less selfish and greedy and far more sympathetic and more in touch with his times than the man who postpones all enjoyment and relaxation until he has accumulated a fortune. There is nothing more delusive than the idea that we are going to do something tomorrow which we believe we cannot afford today. Miss Mullock has well said in one of her books, nobody will see his own blessing or open his heart to enjoy them till the golden hour has gone by forever and he finds out too late all that he might have had and made and done. 
How many people make slaves of themselves, pinch and scrimp, and practice grinding economy all through the best years of their lives, with the firm belief that they are getting ready for great enjoyment in the future? Oh, the waste of life, the precious years lost, getting ready to enjoy. Oh, the delusion of always putting the time of enjoyment in the future, forever deferring good things until the tissues have hardened and the nerves have lost their power to carry agreeable sensations. How many people there are who murder their capacity for enjoyment and make slaves of themselves in trying to hoard up that which they might have enjoyed in their younger days and which will be but a mockery to them late in life. It seems strange that level-headed businessmen who have been such a success in their line should not be able to see that they cannot really enjoy themselves after retiring from an active, busy life unless they have a broad training outside their specialty. After all, what are the things which men expect to enjoy after they retire? It would be a good thing for a man who is thinking of retiring to test a few of the things which he fancies he is going to find enjoyment in after giving up an active life. For example, let him go to the opera. The chances are that he would be bored to death all through the performance. How could he expect to enjoy the opera if his musical faculties had not been developed? Then, let him visit the great art galleries. The average businessman would get tired of this sort of thing inside of two days. His mind had not been trained in that direction. A lifetime of training in a business career had not developed qualities which would help him to appreciate the beauties of art or to measure art values, to see the meaning in the great masterpieces. Then let him try travel, which he thinks is going to be such a delight. He would probably get very tired after a few months wandering from place to place, living without the comforts and luxuries to which he is accustomed to in his own house. If he knew how to play golf, he might get considerable satisfaction out of that, but if he overdid it, he would very soon tire of it. He might try philanthropic work, helping the poor, but it is likely that whatever he did, his mind would constantly be reverting to and longing for his old occupation. The chances are that he would very soon weary of playing at life. The faculties which had been made dominant by so many years of active service would be constantly pulling him towards his business or profession. The great secret of happiness is to learn to enjoy as we go along. Every day should be a holiday in the highest sense of the word. No matter how busy we are, something should be brought into every day's experience which will enlarge, broaden, and enrich the mind. Every day should add a new layer of beauty and joy to life before it gives place to the morrow. It was not intended that one part of life should be filled with joy and the remainder be left barren. It doesn't pay to look forward to enjoyment. A recent writer says, I would as soon chase butterflies for a living or bottle moonshine for a cloudy night. The only way to be happy is to take the drops of happiness as God gives them to us every day of our lives. The boy must learn to be happy while he is plodding over his lessons, the apprentice while he is learning his trade, the merchant while he is making his fortune, or they will be sure to miss their enjoyment when they have gained what they have signed for. There is an Eastern legend of a powerful genius who promised a beautiful maiden a gift of rare value if she would pass through a field of corn and without pausing, going backwards or wandering hither and thither, select the largest and ripest ear, the value of the gift to be in proportion to the size and perfection of the ear she should choose. She passed through the field, seeing a great many well worth gathering, but always hoping to find a larger and more perfect one. She passed them all by, when coming to a part of the field where the stalks grew more stunted. She disdained to take one from these, and so threw to the other side without having selected any. This little fable is a faithful picture of many lives which are rejecting the good things in their way and within their reach for something before them for which they vainly hope. 
but will never secure. On a dark night and in a dangerous place where the footing is insecure, lantern in the hand is worth a dozen stars. The high school boy thinks that he will be happy when he enters college. The freshman is dreaming of the day when he will be a senior. The senior of the time when he will be graduated. The graduate lives only for the propitious hour when he will go into business for himself or start in his profession. And the young man who has just entered on an active career looks forward to the happy time when he shall have saved enough money to build himself a beautiful house. But by the time he has built his fine house, he has become so bound by his business or profession, so absorbed in the everyday routine, that enjoyment must be pushed still further ahead until he can spare a little more time from his business or office or to the indefinite season when he shall retire. He alone is the happy man who has learned to extract happiness not from ideal conditions but from the actual ones about him. The man who has mastered the secret will not wait for ideal surroundings. He will not wait until next year, next decade, until he gets rich, until he can travel abroad, until he can afford to surround himself with works of the great masters. But he will make the most possible of what he has now. If we could see the color of our future, said Canon Farrar, we must look for it in our present. If we would gaze on the star of our destiny, we must look for it in our hearts. The majority of us go through life with our eyes fixed on a distant goal, straining every nerve to reach it. On our way, we pass indescribable beauties of earth and sky and innumerable opportunities to help others over rough places, to brighten and beautify the commonplace life of everyday life. But we see them not, heedless of all that does not point directly toward what we consider the winning post. We finally arrive at our destination to find what? We have perhaps gained what we sought, wealth, the secrets of science, fame. We have satisfied our ambition, it may be, but at the cost of all the sweetens, beautifies, ennobles, and enriches life. The man who has spent all the best years of his life chasing dollars and neglecting everything else, developing one big money gland in the base of his brain to secrete dollars, and letting the upper part of his brain, his ideality, his aesthetic, his social faculties, his friendship, faculties, atrophy, and other higher intellectual faculties dwindle, cannot expect to enjoy much of anything outside of the rut and routine in which he has spent his life. He will be lost when he gets out of it. He will find that outside of these few tracks in his brain formed by his routine life, he will get very little satisfaction because his whole brain has not been developed. It is sad to see a man who has ground his very life into his business, coined his brain and his very soul into making a fortune because he believes that this will be a panacea for all his ills, who after he has his fortune in hand still feels the same emptiness, discontent, the same unsatisfied heart yearnings. Everywhere we see men who have led the commercial life so long, who have pursued it with such zest and such eagerness and grit that they have crushed all of the finer sentiments, all the nobler attributes out of their natures. They have become money-making automatons, getting on specialists, and they are good for nothing else. They are miserable. The moment they are taken out of this atmosphere, their fortune made, they have nothing to which to retire. No matter how much money you may have, Mr. Richman. Your enjoyment must come from the qualities and faculties which you have been exercising the most during your active career. If you have been kind and considerate, if you have been just and generous with those who have helped you to make your fortune, if you have developed your friendship faculties, your social qualities, if you have been just and true during your money-making period, if there are no dirty dollars in your pile, 
if you have not trampled others down in your climb to your fortune, if you have developed your benevolence and generosity, you will be happy. You will enjoy what you have accumulated, but the habits of your past life, the tendencies of your developments will determine the quality of your happiness. Is it not strange that when a man has been developing his selfish qualities, his greed, his grasping nature for a quarter or a half century, and has allowed his friendship faculties, his affection, his generosity, and all of his noble qualities to die from lack of exercise, he should expect that the mere possession of a fortune could transform all of his life habits and give him the enjoyments which could be possible only with the highest development of the grandest qualities in him, instead of the lowest, the animal propensities. We treat our joys as one of my neighbors did her choice currants, said as a writer. Let's have a pie, said the children, when the bushes began to bear. But the mother would not hear of using such fine fruit green, it must ripen. When the currants were ripe, the children begged them for the table, but the mother had decided to save them for jelly when jelly making was proposed. She wanted to wait until other work was out of the way, and she could do it as it ought to be done. But lo, when she was fully ready, the sun, the birds, and an unexpected storm had all been there before her, and the bushes were bare. That's the way we do with our blessings and gladnesses, the mercies that are new every morning. We say, oh, how I could enjoy this if, and then we let the trial, foreboding, or trouble crowd it out of place. Someday, we expect to be ready, really to enjoy our health, our home, our friends. But who can promise us that when that long postponed day comes, the fruit will still be on the bushes? Now, this is a very, very important lesson. This is not saying that making money is bad. It would be easy to take this and then say, oh yeah, going out and making money is bad. No, this is a very important reminder. We are trying to create our perfect reality. I teach the gaining of abundance, the laws of prosperity. I have multiple episodes on my channel. I have a wonderful meditation, the large sums of money meditation and the financial abundance meditation, sleep and grow rich. They're all wonderful meditations. And the idea is you want to make money easily you want to make it quickly and you want it to have to increase in quantity and from multiple sources, but you don't want to drive yourself insane or make yourself sick by doing it. And there's some important lessons to learn from this because by me reading this to you, you may be in the middle of it. Now I know that I have been in this state that's described in this chapter multiple times. And the state itself helped me to survive certain times, of course, but so many wonderful moments I had missed. So many wonderful moments with my kids, with my family, with my parents, so many wonderful trips that I skipped, so many great opportunities that I missed because I was working so hard and I can't have them back. So many wonderful things in my life. Once I started to really notice the joys in every moment, in every breath, and I started to unpack that and really feel it, then I started to receive a different sort of prosperity. The money flowed freely to me, but it was easy and it wasn't difficult and I didn't have to work hard for it. Now I went through this phase that he talks about with the story at the beginning one of the most painful phases in my life was when I stopped enjoying music. I am a music lover, big time. Used to work in a music store in college for years and I would buy the music for the store, but I, I lost a lot of money working at that job because I would listen to everything and I would want to listen to all kinds of music, even music I didn't like to. I went through a phase where I had to collect all the music and I loved it and I could sit in just utter bliss to one or two songs and I would make these soundtracks, these 
soundtracks on my cassette tapes and they were just joyous and wonderful and I would make these incredible killer soundtracks. Then when the iPod came out and I could make these long incredible soundtracks <laughs> in the order that I wanted it was like the ultimate dream but then the music just wasn't as good anymore. It's one of the reasons I love Metaverse that you hear in the background. Metaverse was a really a moment where I started to love music again. And there's lots of music like Metaverse. It, for me, it was Metaverse. And there is inspiring music out there. But I know that many of you have gone through this, you, where the music doesn't sound as good as it was when you were younger, or the TV shows that you watch, or the art that you're looking at. And that's a sign that we're dying inside a little bit. For we should see the beauty in everything and enjoy the architecture and the art and the sound all around us. And once we deaden these faculties, the things we're trying to make money for aren't as important. One of the things I learned from transurfing was running slides and looking at the intermediate parts of your goal. That's one thing that you can do. One of the things that I've taught so far that has been a big realization is the Mitch Horowitz idea, the all-encompassing big goal that you want to try to achieve. And when you do that, the forces that go to work become more obvious and you see the power of your manifestations. But during this process, you want to enjoy the little victories along the way and try to find a way to celebrate everything. When you get into this mode, it's kind of a mode of gratitude and it begins a period where you transmit this vibration out of joy, of beauty, and these things come back to you. It's not just about the money. It's the experiences that we want to have with the money. But people that want to be of service to others and learning the lessons of unconditional love are very difficult when you're struggling to get the next paycheck. So when I'm doing those, I'm speaking to the people out there that have been through what I've been through where you don't know if you're going to get your next paycheck. You're worried you might not be able to live in your house. You feel like you could lose everything and you don't know what to do to change. You have debts and it can be a struggle. So the idea is you want to be able to be in a comfortable place. Once you're in a comfortable place, you can awaken and then you can start helping other people and doing other things. So the primary point is you're not making the money just to make the money. You will not be satisfied by that reality. You want to make the money and you want to make your reality and really broaden your perspective of what kind of reality that you want to create. You're always hitting your mark. That's how reality is created. You create a reality. There's something that you don't like about it. Then keep on creating it. Then create your reality without that thing. Keep fine tuning it just like a beautiful painting. And it's not about the money. The money gives you the resources. It gives you the means. It's an energy. But you don't want to be down the road and unable to enjoy life. Enjoy the living. Don't postpone your enjoyment. Your enjoyment in the future is not tied to this goal. You can enjoy every moment and it will bring the future to you faster. So don't postpone your enjoyment today. Go out and enjoy the day, please. It's a wonderful day. You are alive. It's a magnificent day. Something wonderful is happening for you right now. And I want you to feel the joy of it. There's no reason to postpone your enjoyment. Thank you for sharing this with me. And I hope it touches deep down in your heart. The codes of this music and my voice are reaching deep down into you, awakening the warming love in your heart. And as an agent of unconditional love, I activate you as an agent of unconditional love. All good things will come to you and there is plenty of it. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution.